Hi guys and welcome to a new video series. This one's going to be about connecting to a database inside Visual Studio and I'm going to introduce you to a technology called Link to SQL. Uh, it's developed by Microsoft a few years ago and is one of actually many ways that you can connect to a database using .NET. I've selected this one because it's um, a good example of a more modern technology. It's used in industry um, it's great for small projects and for websites and stuff like that. It works with WPF, WingForms, um, basically all the .NET uh, technologies are out there. So it's a good introduction and Link itself, which is, if you want to think of it as like a language within itself, is a great query language and you'll find that Link's used in various places in .NET. So having an understanding of it can be quite useful and indeed you can use Link in other parts of Windows as well. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to take you step by step through using Link to SQL to uh, do what we call some basic uh, queries. And later on in the series, I might even introduce you to the idea of what you can do with as far as what we call CRUD, which is create, read, update, and delete data. But for this video, we're just going to explore how to get started with Link, what tools we can use in Visual Studio to help us do that and do some basic select queries and see what kind of results we can get from it. Okay, so with that we'll get started. I'm going to, I'm in Visual Studio here and I'm going to create a standard WPF app like we've done with all our tutorials. And I'm going to call this one Link Demo. Once the uh, Visual Studio has finished creating our WPF app, I'm going to just add one button to the project for now. Okay, it's just waiting for it to update. There we go. So I'll add a button. And I'm going to call this button, button results, change its uh, content as well. Great. All right. So that's all we're going to have as far as the uh, graphical user interface side of things, the XAML side of things is concerned for now. I will uh, come back later and add some more. So I'm just going to double click on the button to take us into the click event. Computer's running a little bit slow today, I'm not quite sure why. There we go. Alright, so now we've got the basic bare bones of the project ready to go. I need to know how I'm going to connect to the database and what database I'm going to use. So I've decided for this um, particular example, I'm going to use the Northwind database, which is one that we've looked at previously. So you'll have a little bit of an idea of how that's actually structured. And I need to bring up the Server Explorer in Visual Studio in order to connect to that database. Now I have it down here um, just on a tab next to the toolbox. Uh, you may not. And I'm just, uh, again, this computer is being very slow. I'm not sure why. We just had a, an update of the Windows um, operating system a few minutes ago and I think that might have a little bit of a bearing. I'm also getting an error there, so I might just get rid of that error as well. Right, there we go. Okay, so if you haven't got Server Explorer down here next to your toolbox, you'll need to uh, pop it into view, and you can do that by going to the view menu here and selecting Server Explorer from the list. Okay, so we're going to add a data connection to our instance of Northwind, which will be on a SQL server somewhere. Now, if you're doing this, <coughs> In an enterprise environment, in a, in a work environment, you might connect to what we call a remote server, to some other server, perhaps somewhere else in the company. Uh, in these examples, I'm going to be using my local machine, and that would be probably what you're going to do too if you installed SQL Server on your machine. So I'm going to say uh, add connection. I'm going to make sure that the data source type is selected Microsoft SQL Server. Say OK. And then I need to put in the server name. So in my case, I've got a local instance of SQL Server. 
So I'm going to put in the name of this particular computer and the name of uh, the actual instance of SQL, which is called SQL Express in my case. Now I should be able to get down to the bottom where it says connect to a database and from the drop down list I should be able to choose Northwind if that's actually installed on my machine. You might want to check that uh, that actually is installed before you do this exercise. OK, I'm going to test the connection. All went well, so I'll say OK. And now I have a connection to the Northwind and this is all inside Visual Studio, don't forget. So I can actually now open up and have a look at all the tables that make up my Northwind database. I can see the uh, field names for each of the tables as well. And I can even have a preview of the data. So if I want to see what the customers look like, I can right click on the customers table and say show table data. That will generate a basic select query. And as you can see here, um, Visual Studio will actually put up um, quite friendly um, grid type view, show me all the data that's in that customer table and even let me navigate through them and tell me how many records in total there are. So there's 91 customers in this particular case because we've got 91 records. So that's great because we can actually sort of check to see whether our queries are working by going back and looking at the data source. Okay, so now that we've made a connection and we've been able to do a basic query so we can see actually it's all working, we're now ready to start learning about how to do this link to SQL. And before I do that, I guess it's probably worth mentioning a couple of the advantages of the link to SQL model. Um, certainly one of its key advantages is it's quick. Uh, if you're writing a database or a connection to a database for, say, a simple website or for something that's not doing a lot of data intensive work, um, this technology works really, really well. It's, it's easy to set up, easy to program, and you'll get results very quickly. Um, you can do things with it like, for example, creating tables and reading data dynamically. You can do what's called paging, where if you've got a really large data set, you can actually choose to only bring back so many records at a time uh, to help with both the retrieval speed and also with uh, memory usage. So that's useful. Um, you can use what's called Lambda expressions, which once you get familiar with those are really, really handy. Uh, we're going to sort of steer clear of Lambda expressions in this introductory video because that's another topic in itself. Uh, I don't want to confuse us too much with too many new things in one video. But as you get more familiar with uh, the idea of accessing databases, Lambda becomes quite useful. And it's worth pointing out here too that accessing a database from a program or a website, for example, is a very, very common scenario. Uh, I really can't remember the last time I did a project that didn't have a database of some description working with it. It's just what you do. And so this um, series of videos I'm doing on Link to SQL should prove really useful to you in the future as well. All right, um, so what's the disadvantages of this model that we're using, this Link to SQL? There are a few, but I think the main one is it's not quite as clear or self-evident uh, the relationships between tables and things like that. There are some other tools out there uh, from Microsoft and other third parties which are called Object Relational Mappers. And a lot of those tools have some very nice graphical interfaces that sort of explain what's going on and the relationships. They can be a little bit more efficient at working with large data sets going into the means of records as well. Uh, they can also, in some cases, abstract the actual query or the link code, if you like, away from the actual um, uh, event-driven sort of code that you write. But in this project, we're not going to go that far and we don't really have any reason to. And truth be told, in a lot of scenarios, um, those other tools, while they're great, can be overkill. So this one we're showing you today is actually quite useful and, uh, and quite relevant for a lot of small projects. So. Having said all that and give us a bit of an overview of Link, let's actually get working with it. Now at the moment my project doesn't know anything about Link, so I'll need to actually add a class, a special type of class to make it aware of Link. So I'm going to right click on my project, I'm going to say add new item. <coughs> I'm going to choose data from the list on the left hand side there. And what I'm looking for is this link to SQL classes. 
Now, before I go ahead and just click add, I need to really name this to something more meaningful than what its default is, which is data classes one. So I'm actually going to name this the same as my database. So I'm going to call it Northwind and add that to my WPF project. It'll create a couple of files for me, or three files for me, and then it will then create this pane, which appears here, which is currently blank, and it's saying to me um, that the object relational designer allows you to visualize your classes in your code. Uh, you can create data classes by dragging them from Server Explorer or Toolbox. So Server Explorer is what we've been just connecting up to a few moments ago that's got all the tables uh, and all the information about the Northwind database. So what you can do now is drag across into this um, pane here the tables that you would like to work with in this particular project. So if you're only going to work with customers, for example, you can just drag customers straight in there. If later on you discover you want to work with employees, you can go back in here and you can add employees later. For this demonstration, I'm just going to drag them all in there so you can see what that looks like. So I'm going to select categories, hold down the shift key, select territories, and then drag the whole lot over the top of this new pane that's appeared. In a few moments, um, what's basically happened is the uh, Visual Studio has generated a whole stack of code behind the scenes that allows uh, Visual Studio to understand the schema of our database. So it now understands the relationships and the field types, data types, and all the different tables and field names and so forth. And it even gives us a uh, nice little graphical representation of them. So we can see those relationships here. Um, just to give you an idea what the code looks like, if I go into uh, here, this is the background, this is actually the code behind, you can see that there's a whole stack of code that's been written for us. And we didn't write any of this. This is all done for us just by that simple drag and drop operation. And you'll never have to touch this stuff. It's just been generated. It's very nice, solid, reliable code. So it just gets done for you. You don't have to think about it. All right. So there we are. We've dragged it across. We've got our diagram. I'm happy with that. So I'm going to close that new file and say yes to saving the changes. And now our W project is ready to work with uh, Link. So let's go back and revisit the actual WPF side of things. So we had a button and we created a click event for the button here. Let's zoom in a bit for you. Okay. So now we're ready to query the database and get some results back. So I'm going to start with the customers table because I know there's 91 records in the customers table from that earlier preview I did. So that will be a good test to see whether actually my code is working the way I expect it should if I tell Link to return all the customers. Um, we're going to create what's called a context. And a context is our connection to the database through the code. Now, if you recall earlier, I called the um, data class that we created, that special link data class, I called it Northwind. And so what uh, I find in IntelliSense as I start to type Northwind is there's a thing called a Northwind data context. This contains the connection string and also links into all that code that's been generated for us. So that's what I want. I'm going to select that with the tab key. And I have to create an instance of this, one that I can work with, so I have to come up with a name. Now I could use DB, I could use context. Uh, you can call it free if you want. But just try and come up with some consistent pattern of what you use. I'm going to use context in mine. And then I say equals new. And then I'm going to select Northwind Data Context again with the brackets and a semicolon. So what we've done now is create an instance of that data context that we're going to call in our case context. So now that we've established that connection, we're actually ready to start the link query itself. Now we need somewhere, once we retrieve all our customers, to actually store them somewhere uh, after the link's finished. So I'm going to use a bar and I'm going to create a place to keep them once, they get, once they're retrieved called My Customers. That makes sense when you think about it. So now I've got that. I now need to write the actual query. Now, if you've had any experience with writing SQL queries and select queries in particular, 
some of this is going to look a bit familiar to you because um, basically this link query we're going to write is going to be converted by .NET into a SQL query and then run against our database and then return the results and, give them, and put them back into my customers. So the syntax is a bit similar uh, to what we're used to. And the good thing I think about Link is if you haven't had much to do with databases at all, I think after a little while it's actually easier to understand uh, quite possibly than what SQL itself is. So let's get started and see how it works. First of all I'm going to type the reserve word from and now I have to come up with um, a name for my copy of the customer's table. And this can be anything you like. So I can call this cust, for example, or I could just call it C. Again, it doesn't matter. This is just a label, if you like, that we're going to call our table customers. So I'll call mine cust. And now what we're going to do is say that that is coming from um, sorry, I'll put that in. Uh, that is coming from context dot, and when I press dot, uh, context is aware of all our tables. So IntelliSense brings them up for us, and if I start typing customers, uh, there we are. There it is. So I'll just tab that and select it. Okay. So now we've got a place to put the results coming back, which is called My Customers. And we have our own copy, if you like, of the customer table and its, def and its, its schema, which we've called Cust. So all I'm going to do now is go Select Cust. And that's going to tell um, Link to SQL, basically, get back every field and every record from customers and put a copy of those into the My Customers bar that we've got there. And that's it. Now if we run the query now, and I'll do that, I'll press F5 and run it. Okay, there's our window there. Click on Result. Uh, nothing's going to happen, or at least nothing seems to have happened. In fact, it did work but I won't see any result on the screen. So I've got two choices here at this point. I could either use a debugger and perhaps put a debugger on the actual link query here and have a look and see what's going on. Or I could use a message box. So keep this nice and visual and easy for you to see on the uh, video. I'm going to use a message box. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to simply print onto the screen the number of records or number of customers, if you like, that I've retrieved. So I've used a message box here, and I've just simply said my customers dot count to string. Remembering, of course, that um, count's going to bring back a number. Message box expects a string, so I had to convert it back to a string. Let's try that again. F5. Click on result, and we get the answer 91. So indeed, it's loaded 91 customers. And as you saw, it's quite quick at doing that as well, which is nice. Okay. So that's a basic select query. And uh, as you can see, there's not much really to it. Let's do one more just to make sure we've got the understanding of how this works. So I'm going to create another query. This time I'm going to bring back all the employees that we've got in our database. Okay. Which I'll leave that message box up there. And below it, we'll go ahead and do the new code. I'll just um, comment that previous query. There we go. All right. So the first step, create a bar. And that's going to be where we're going to store the employees that come back. So I'll call mine my employees. Then we've got to say uh, what our, our copy of the employee schema and data is going to be called. So I'm going to call it M. And then I have to say it's coming from context.employees. That tells it all about the connection string, tells it all about the table. Okay, so now I've done that, I can simply say I want to select all the employees from there. So I just simply put select M, semicolon to finish the query. That's finished the link uh, to SQL query. And now I'll do another message box just to see my employees.counts. 
case dot to the string and that should bring back the total number of employees. Now I'm not sure how many employees I've got, so what I might do as a test before I get started is I'll right click on the employees and say show table data. And I can see there that I've got nine employees. So I should be getting back nine when I run this link query. I'll press F5 and run it. And I get back nine, so that's great. So that worked. Okay, so we're seeing two simple select queries. It would be exactly the same process if I was doing this for any of the other tables that are in Northwind. Um, and indeed, every query, every link query can share the same context. So if I wanted to have multiple buttons that did different queries, different link queries, what I could do is take my context out of the click event and put it up towards the top below the um, class definition here. And that means that all the button click events would use the same context, and that's perfectly fine. You don't have to keep recreating that context every time you have a click event. Um, I just simply had it in there because that's where I started coding. But if I run this now, uh, it won't make any difference at all to my project uh, because that context can be seen by every click event now. It'll still work fine. All right. So... As I say, now I've got all these records back, that's great, but obviously most of the time the user wants to see the, the list of employees on the screen. And at the moment all we're getting back is just a total number of employees that are actually available. So we've got to go an extra step here, and we've got to put some sort of uh, component or tool onto our main window into the XAML that's going to allow us to see the results. And that's what I'm going to do now. So I'll just move my button over to the side there a little bit. and select my toolbox and the uh, component I'm going to use is called the data grid. It's a great general purpose tool just for this kind of work where you want to show information from a table or from some sort of a list. Um, we can configure it many different ways but we're going to keep it nice and simple in this demonstration so I've just simply dragged it onto the uh, form and while I've got it there I'll also change its name from data grid 1 to data grid result. And for now, that's all I'm going to do to it. Let's pop back into our code behind. And let's have a bit of a talk about the next bit, which is, okay, I've got this variable called my employees and it's storing all my employees. How do I get that linked up to the data grid I just added onto the XAML? It's pretty straightforward. All I've got to do is put in the name of the grid that I've dragged on there, which is called data grid result dot. And there is a property called item source. And this is basically asking us also, well, you know, where does this come from? Where are you getting the data from that you want to put in the data grid? So I'm going to say it equals my employees. And a semicolon on the end there to finish it off the line. So now our data grid is aware of my employees. Now, if you haven't done this before, you might think at this point, well, this should be you know, sweet. It should be all done now. Let's run it and just see what happens when I click on that uh, on the result button. So the first thing I do it should do is see a message box, and then I should see my employees. Let's see what happens. So there's a list of employees is nine. And I get this. Now, it's not all bad news because if I actually count them up, I'll actually find there is, in fact, nine rows. So the data grid is actually trying to display uh, the records. The problem it's having is it doesn't know how the records are made up. It doesn't know what the field names are, and it doesn't know how to display those field names. So we've got a little bit more work to do with the data grid to tell it about the field names that we'd like to see, and then we should be fine. So I'll stop the program go back to the XAML view, and we need to modify this data grid. So um, I've got the data grid selected at the moment. I've clicked on it once, or you can click down here actually on the line that the data grid's in. And I'm going to go up to columns. And it's a bit like a spreadsheet, you, you know, you have columns and rows, so we need to define the columns. 
Now I click on the little ellipse button there and I get this uh, editor view. And we can see at the moment there are no columns at all uh, for this grid. So that's not good. I want to start off with, say, uh, two columns. So I'll click Add Twice. That puts two data grid text columns into my project. Um, and it puts the properties for each one of those over here on the right-hand side. So, for example, I can go into the header and I can choose to change that to whatever name of the field that I want to use. So just to refresh ourselves here for a moment, um, I'll just pull up SQL Express Management Studio here, or SQL Server Management Studio, I should say. And just to refresh ourselves, in the North Wind tables, customers, we had a company name and we had a contact name. Now it is important at this point I make a note of the spelling and also the capitalization, any use of spaces or underscores. That's not critical for the header, but it's going to be critical for the step after the header. So I'm just checking what they are to make sure I understand them. And I'm going to put in company name for the space because that's the way people would normally read it for the header. And for the binding, I can type it in here and go through a few steps, but to be honest with you, uh, I, I don't like doing it that way, it's a bit fiddly. So all I'm going to do at the moment is I'm just going to do the header for both of these. And I'll call the other one uh, contact name and say OK. What we've done so far is we've generated some XAML code. We've got now what's called a data grid columns. Let's zoom in a bit there for you. And it's created two data grid text columns which we've got for company name and contact name. And we can see them also here visually on the uh, preview. Now, they're not going to actually display the data yet. We have to do what's called binding. And binding is a whole new world in itself. It's one of the really cool features of WPF uh, and Silverlight. It's a causal feature of Windows 8 Modern as well. Um, it's more of an advanced topic. We're only going to really sort of scratch the surface with it. But to give you a basic idea, Everything in WPF is able to be made aware of everything else. You can basically uh, bind it or create a relationship between one thing and another. So what we're going to do is create a relationship between our data text column and an actual field that has the data in it. So next to the company name here, I'm going to type binding, which comes up in IntelliSense. So I'll press tab. Now I'm going to use my curly brace. And he brings up another IntelliSense, and I'm going to choose binding again, and a space. And now I have to type in the name of the field exactly how it is spelt, and exactly all the same capitalization, spaces, whatever it might be, as what I saw in the database columns uh, names. So this one was company name, and there were no spaces that used capitalization on C and N for the beginning of each uh, word. And that's it. Now I'm going to repeat that step for each one. So I'm going to make this um, contact name. Take that out. Okay. So what we end up with now is binding equals and then curly braces binding and then the name of the field. And what's going to happen is when we run the project, item sources is going to be connected to the data grid. The data grid is going to see that and go, aha, I can see a data source. Can you bring back for me all the company names and the contact names because I want to display them uh, in this data grid. Let's give it a go. Right, so there's our two columns. Let's click on result. There are nine, in, uh, nine employees, ah, and they should be appearing there. So let's have a look and see what we've done wrong. I know what we've done wrong. I was looking at customers, wasn't I? And I should have been looking at employees. So 
So I could edit that out of the video, but if I did, then that would be very fair because it makes me look like I don't make mistakes, and I do. So I'm doing this at uh, midnight, so that might help. So uh, I'll do this one again. I was looking at employees table. I should have been looking at employees, not at um, customers, because I was doing the link query on employees. So there's a last name and a first name. This is an easy fix, this one. I'm just going to change the bindings to the correct field names. And I'll also change the headers. And we'll try again. All right, results, nine employees, and now I've used the correct field names. We can see them displayed there. So what if we want some other fields? Very simple, just create another data uh, grid text column, set up the header, set up the binding, and it'll appear over on the side here. So once you've added a couple of them like I've done here, the easiest way typically is just simply to select one of the old ones, Copy it, Control C, paste it underneath, then just change the details to whatever you want. So let's have a look. We've got a um, we've got a title. So let's have a go at putting that in. So I'll change the header for that one I've just copied to title. Change the binding name to title F5. In a few moments, there we go, the results. And now we've got last name, first name, and title. As easy as that. Now you can do some things as well if you want to format these a bit, you can. Uh, one that can be handy sometimes is you might want to set the ar a width, like an arbitrary width. So if you want to, you can go in there and say width equals uh, 220 which will force last name to, bit, to take up that much space if that's what you want to do. Or you can just let the data grid work it out for itself. It's up to you. Um, now I've got that data in there, I want to go back to the query and I want to just finesse the query a little bit, make it a little bit more efficient. Now keep in mind we've only got nine employees, so this is really kind of redundant for this example because there isn't that much information to start with. But what you've got to think about is what if this was a list of several hundred employees? Uh, we'd be bringing back a fair bit of fair bit of information from the first, say, 900 employees. So how can we make sure we're not bringing back any more than we really require? Well, in this example I've just done, I've decided that the only three things I'm really interested in are their last name, their first name, and their title. So I'm going to go back to the link query, and I'm just going to add a couple of things to it to tell the link query that they're the only three things I'm really interested in and not to bother trying to get all the other information, all the other fields from the database because well, I'm not going to use them. So let's go back and have a look at our original query. There it is there. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to modify, let's point out my little cheat sheet here that I've got. I'm going to modify that query take out the emp part that we had before and instead I'm going to say select new and then I'm going to put curly braces in and inside these curly braces I'm going to list the fields that I would like to know so I want to know emp dot Last name, and put a comma, and dot first name, comma, and I want to know imp dot title. Okay, I don't need to put a comma in the last one. And I need to put the semicolon that I deleted earlier and put that at the end of the curly braces. So this hasn't changed what the query is going to do. The query is still going to come back with nine employees. What it is going to be different about at this time, though, is it's going to say, look, I only need to know about these three fields. So don't bother giving me the hire date. Don't bother giving me the employee ID. I don't need them. So you can save time on searching. And you can save memory as well, because I don't need to store them uh, for the user to see. 
Let's see how that looks when we run the query now that we've modified it. So there's my uh, grid result. We still get nine employees back and we still see them. And it works basically the same. It's very hard when we've only got a database and tables that are very small like this one to see the value of this. But rest assured that if you're working with a larger database with a lot more records, this is actually very useful to be able to sort of just nominate those fields you'd like to return. Okay, so that's good. So now we've got a way of querying our database and bringing back a whole heap of our um, table data and we can see it in there. Just about finishes off for our first video um, and hopefully I didn't confuse you too much with that uh, accidental uh, mix up there between the employees and the customers table. Let's look at one more slight variation on all these which is... Okay, so now we're showing you how to do um, a couple of linked SQL queries that bring back a number of customers or a number of employees and we can display them in our data grid. The last step I want to do in this particular introductory video is just look at the scenario where you don't want to bring back a whole stack of people, you would just like to bring back one person and that's all you're interested in. So let's revisit our employees table for a moment, just have a look there. We can see we've got nine employees and what I'd like to do in my link queries, I'd like to bring back Stephen, pardon me, Stephen Buchanan, who's employee ID 5. And that's the only person I'm interested in for my particular query. So I've commented here the previous queries we've done. In fact, I'll take the customers one out so as not to confuse things. And there's the query that we've been using just to query all the employees and bring them all back. And let's do a variation of this that's now going to bring back uh, Mr. Buchanan's record. So I'm going to say var my employee equals, and this one's a little bit different, and I put brackets in. Now we didn't do this in the previous one, and I could have, uh, you could put brackets in at this point. Um, I just took a shortcut with the previous one because it's fairly late at night and I'm tired, and you just my brain's going, well, hey, we'll just do shortcuts because that gets us done early. But um, you can certainly put brackets in, and this one we will need them. So I'm going to say from em in context dot employees. So if we have a look at that line, it's virtually identical to the first uh, query I did, except for those brackets. Let's have a look at the next line. Now the next line I went on straight to the select in the first example. In this one, I'm going to use where. So if you've done anything with SQL, uh, you'll know that the where clause is really useful. It's actually a way of filtering your data and only finding specific data you're after that matches. And that's exactly what we want to do here because we don't want to bring back uh, Mr. Buchanan, so that means we want employee ID 5. So what I'm going to do now is type m dot employee ID dot equals bracket and then the number 5. So now we've filtered our query so I want to look for a match on employee ID 5, which is great. And next I'm going to do that select new bit where we actually decided what fields we wanted to bring back so we didn't bring back all of them. And uh, I'm going to do a very similar one to I did the first one. So I'm going to say select new, employee braces, <clears throat> and I'm going to say let's bring back the employee last name, and let's say the employee first name. I'll skip the title for this one. Okay. So far, so good. <clears throat> so the last bit I'm going to do is I'm going to put a dot right into that um, second, you know, the closing uh, curly, uh, closing bracket, I should say. And I'm going to choose first or default. And what this telling link is, look, if you by any chance happen to find two employees with exactly the same employee number, you shouldn't, but if you do, just bring me back the first one. Don't worry about the second one. So it's just a little bit of a safeguard there. So I'm going to say do that. And I'm going to put a semicolon on the end to finish the query. So the two key changes that we've made in this query from the previous one. We are now using a where clause because we're trying to filter the data, in this case, to a specific employee. 
By the way, you can use a where clause in this one as well if you want to bring back a lot of employees. Maybe you want to bring back a lot of employees whose name starts with L. You could do that. And that's uh, something we'll explore a bit more in class and perhaps in another video. But for now, we're using it to just get back employee ID 5. <clears throat> the only other change we've really done is we've used the uh, bracket here and here to encapsulate our link query. And then at the end of that, we've put first or default to make sure that link knows just to bring back one if it finds multiple matches. And that's it. Now, let's see how that looks if we try and use our data grid. So we'll bring up our data grid. We'll say data grid one dot items source equals my employee. Now that's what we typed um, last time basically and you know, hey it should work and when we try and run it we get this error message and it won't work and the long story short is that um, before we were bringing back a list because uh, we found multiple employees so it brought them back and it defined that var as being a list and data grids can show lists. When we brought back the query from this one, Link has said, hey, there's no list, there's only a single record. And so it actually has changed the, um, what VAR is actually storing, the data type it's storing, in a way that is not compatible with a data grid. So what does this mean? This means if you're working with single records, you're going to have to bind them to something else. You can bind them to a text box, for example, if you've got a, uh, a form that you want to let people see all the details of this person and be able to edit them and that kind of thing. Again, that's something to look at a little bit later in a more advanced um, unit and in a more advanced video. But for now, we just want to see if this person's come back. So how are we going to do it? Well, to keep it simple, I'm just going to use a message box rather than the data grid there. So I'm going to message box to show. <coughs> Pardon me. And I'm going to use a feature called string.format. String.format is pretty darn good value. And basically what it does is it concatenates strings. Now you've probably done this before and used the plus sign. That would work as well. But hey, we've got a new video. I think we all know how to join strings together using plus. So let's look at a, a little bit more sophisticated way of doing it and a nicer way of doing it once you're used to it. So I'm going to put in quotes what I'd like to display. And I'm using a curly brace here. So I'll type it in first and then I'll explain what I've done. Essentially what I've done inside that string is I've created what's called placeholders. And I've said where you see that uh, curly brace zero replace that with something else. When you see the curly brace one, replace that with something else that's different. And when you put those two things and replace them, leave a space between them because I've left a space. That's important because we want to see last name, space, first name. So string.format's okay with that, but it's still complaining because it says we'll replace them with what? You haven't told me what that thing is you want me to replace them with. So outside that bracket, I'm going to say my employee dot uh, let's say first name, comma, my employee dot last name. And we'll just need a another bracket to finish with the message box. We hope. If I haven't left something else out here, let's have a look. One, two, one, two. And a bracket in the wrong spot. So basically, what I've done here is I've said, okay, take this, this first placeholder, and replace it with this. Take the second placeholder after a space, because there's a space there, and replace it with this. Now, internally to .NET, string.format actually works much faster than if you just use the plus sign and try to join together or concatenate a whole bunch of strings. So there is some, there is some advantages to it from a performance point of view. But the other reason I do it this way as well is because if you're doing strings that are very long and have lots and lots of bits of data joined together, this actually becomes much easier to read and much easier to edit 
than trying to read a really long string that's got all plus signs everywhere through it and you're trying to sort of picture what that's going to make. Let's see how it works. We'll press F5. Okay. Click Result. And there we go. Stephen Buchanan comes back as our name of uh, employee ID 5. So I hope that's giving you a bit of a feel for what linked to SQL can do. It's a wonderful way to be able to access your databases once you get comfortable with it. It's quick. Uh, once you get a bit more comfortable with that syntax, it works great. Now, I was a little bit hesitant with it in this video. One reason is because it's fairly late at night that I'm recording this. The other reason why is because I use some other tools these days to access databases, which aren't quite the same. And the reason why it throws me off is because I still use Link, but I use a slightly different variation of it. And I use a thing called Lambda Expressions as well. So it took me a couple of moments to adjust. But to put it into perspective, I haven't used Link to um, SQL for about five years. So it's been quite a while since I've used this technology, not because there's anything wrong with it, just because I've had um, access to other technologies I've, I've personally chosen because I, I like them. But I certainly don't have a problem with this at all. But it just took me a few minutes to get used to it. But even so, five years later, it wasn't that bad at all, and I had my queries up and going fairly quickly. So once you've got used to it, it's a great way to quickly get in there, get some data out. Great for websites, by the way. If you want to do web development, this, this approach to doing data for websites is just fantastic. And the other reason it's really good is it avoids a thing called SQL injection, which is a security vulnerability when you're using SQL scripts. Um, this takes care of it for you. You don't have to worry about that. It will make sure that this, the uh, queries it makes are perfectly safe to work with your database and are able to be easily accessed by hackers uh, using that sort of approach, a SQL injection approach. And after a while, it comes very easy to read as well. So the secret to learning this and becoming good at it really is just to practice it. I'd suggest you, you try this video a couple of times at least and make sure you're comfortable with it. Um, and also, I will put up some queries for you, uh, uh, some questions rather for you that uh, require you to write some uh, linked to SQL queries. I think it's a great idea if you go through them and try them. I think the more practice you get this, the more it makes sense, the more you see the pattern involved in it. And pretty soon, you'll be rattling off these queries, no problems at all. And the variations of this, well, I want to show you a bit later, are, are really pretty simple once you've understood what I've explained in this video. So I hope you found it useful. Um, please take the time to practice these things and make sure you understand them well. It'll make it much easier for you to get through this particular unit. It'll also make it much easier for you in the future when you have to query a database from uh, your .NET project or from PowerShell or some other things. It's built into .NET, it works great, so it's definitely worth uh, knowing more about it. And you can also get a, a mono version of it that runs on um, Android and iPhones and iPads as well. So uh, until next time, uh, thanks for watching.